Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriela Ramos, and I am the Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO. Before we begin, a reminder that English and Spanish interpretation is available. So please click the language option at the bottom of your screen. Gabriela Boucher is Colombian and I'm Mexican, so we'll be speaking Spanish in the second edition of the inclusive dialogue series for UNESCO. But you have the option to listen to Gabriela in English as well. And of course, it's a pleasure to welcome you and Gabrielle Boucher, who is the executive director at Oxfam International and who is a great uh, social justice leader who's played a very important role in analyzing and putting forward proposals within Oxfam to respond to the impact of COVID-19 in our societies and in our countries. Gabriella was born in Cali, Colombia. She is a champion for feminist leadership, and she's worked alongside communities affected by Colombia's armed conflict, and she's also contributed to peace building. The social uh, restorative justice approach. And she's also worked on the condition of children. Before working at Oxfam International, she also worked at the iconic organization uh, Fundación Plan Colombia, as well as Plan Internacional. So thank you very much, Gabriela, for being here today in this second edition of the Dialogue and Inclusion Series at UNESCO. Thank you, Gabriela. It's also a pleasure to be here and to be able to discuss this in Spanish, in other languages than English, seeing as we're both from Latin America. Yes, indeed, and it's a pleasure to share this platform because in the field of social and human sciences at UNESCO, we're trying to maximize the contribution of uh, your organization to respond to the issues of inequality, racism, and of course, uh, worrying trends. So I'd like to begin this dialogue by recognizing or acknowledging what's obvious, which has been documented by your institution as well. Our countries are also addressing these issues. Inequalities have made COVID a much more costly and much more damaging pandemic with an impact on health, uh, societies and economies. And this has increased inequality. So what we're seeing is a very concerning trend because although the numbers were already worrying, this asymmetrical and unequal impact that the COVID pandemic is having on the most vulnerable communities and on women is extremely concerning. So I'd like to ask you to begin this exchange by giving us your vision, Oxfam's vision of why we're in this situation and what we could do to respond with robust solutions once this pandemic is under control. Thank you, Gabriela. I think the situation is extremely concerning and we've called this situation the inequality virus at Oxfam because, of course, the virus is affecting a world that was already extremely unequal. But inequalities have been amplified world over. The IMF had already carried out studies on other viruses that showed that inequality had increased as a result, increased as a result. But what we're seeing here is that the impact is global at a catastrophic level. And Oxfam has looked into the fact that this uh, pandemic, which has been having an effect for a year and a half now, 
has increased inequality simultaneously in all countries. This is the first time in records, uh, since records began. So lots of people, or the majority of people living in the world's poorest countries could take over a decade to recover from this pandemic. And in comparison, the multi-billionaires could recover their losses within only nine months to return to pre-crisis levels. So as you can see, there's a huge contrast if you compare this with the increase in poverty. So what we're seeing is a huge concentration of power as well. At the moment, the decisions of a very uh, small handful of people are having a huge impact on the rest of the planet. And a very clear example of this is vaccine inequity, because all countries need to be able to vaccinate the entire population, and we need to be able to do so as soon as possible because we're affected by this pandemic on a daily basis, not only in terms of people's health, uh, mortality, but also in terms of economic effects. And what we're seeing is monopolies among pharmaceutical companies. At the moment, vaccines are commodities, they're uh, goods that are sold and bought, and there doesn't seem to be a plan to ensure access to vaccines for the global population. So this is having a devastating impact. And we tend to think, well, this is how things work. This is the economic model that we've always had. And in recent years, a number of decisions have been taken that prioritize economic interests above the well-being of people. There's also a trend to privatization and a focus on stimulating economic growth and production. And this is expected to have a trickle-down effect, but it's not what we're seeing. In the face of the pandemic, 10 million people could die every day, uh, well over, due to a lack of medical attention. And millions of people could end up in poverty each year due to this situation due to the lack of access to medical care. If a family is already in a precarious situation, then having a, a health issue could force them into poverty. And only a small portion of workers actually have adequate social protection. So it's been clear from the beginning of the pandemic that high levels of unemployment has meant that the situation has not improved. Yes, indeed, these are fundamental issues that we've been looking into and the Oxfam has been studying. Let's focus on vaccines because I think it's something that you have really been uh, working on. You've issued an important call. But of course, within the international institutions, with the Bioethics Committee at UNESCO, we've called for vaccines to be a global public good. Uh, vaccines were developed with uh, public funds. It was this investment that allowed these pharmaceutical companies to develop these vaccines much more quickly. Now, we're not uh, discussing a situation that's new in the face of COVID. The model has been around for years. But what we're seeing is a failure in terms of health protection. What can we learn from this? What would you propose to respond to this? Because at the end of the day, governments are aiming to control the Delta variant 
And uh, of course, they need to also be focusing on vaccination. We need to continue pushing for this. But what would be your key messages in terms of the failings of governments, including in the most developed countries? And how could we learn to ensure that this never occurs again? Well, of course, yes, we need to learn. And for many countries in Europe and in North America, we feel like we are starting to gain control over the pandemic. But the situation is terrible if you consider that only 0.3% of vaccines worldwide have actually reached the poorest countries with the current vaccine rate the least developed countries could be waiting up to 57 years to reach full vaccination levels. So as you can see, the gap is huge and it could increase exponentially. So the difference and the gaps are visible. The gap between uh, developed countries with high levels of vaccination compared to Uganda, for example, India or Colombia, my country, where there are uh, high uh, levels of prevalence. So unfortunately, science is not necessarily an effective shield, as you mentioned, 100 billion euros have been invested in order to ensure that these vaccines are developed. But the problem now is the inequality in access and distribution. So what we're advocating for is a people's vaccine, a vaccine or formulas for vaccines should be uh, shared so that vaccines can be produced widely in various different countries. Vaccines in general, not just COVID vaccines, are mostly produced in uh, middle or low income countries. So by transferring these formulas and intellectual property, this could help us respond to this pandemic but also to agree that this could be a response in future pandemics as well. And this initiative is supported by South Africa and India, and also by various international organizations who are working on this project. President Biden has also supported it, and other leaders have as well. And we're expecting Germany, or we're hoping that Germany and the European Union will follow suit and uh, allow us to respond to this situation. There's also the possibility of pharmaceutical companies themselves sharing this technology or formulas through the World Health Organization mechanism. But unfortunately, up until now, this hasn't been used. So basically, we're in a situation where the pandemic is uh, going on and on. And unfortunately, variants continue to mutate. And in this case, uh, countries who haven't uh, received their full doses of vaccine are faced with a huge challenge. So we can't continue along this path. Well, yes, in fact, it's in your own interests, really, in your best interests of making sure that vaccines are available. I think that the call that you and Oxfam have issued and that has been discussed and supported by Joe Biden, which consists in sharing patents and formulas, is necessary. There are lots of discussions about logistics and the uh, ingredients of this solution. But if we don't start by increasing the supply, which would have a positive impact uh, in terms of capacity building in low middle income countries, we won't be able to overcome this pandemic. Now, of course, this may seem like a short term issue, but there are also longer term issues. The United States has received a massive uh, capital injection and uh, is uh, expecting growth rates of up to 6%. 
So those countries who didn't have the fiscal space for these uh, significant uh, injections of cash will be left behind. So the panorama is difficult. Oxfam has been a champion in terms of uh, financing and ensuring uh, financial flow. So could you tell us how you see the need to support developing countries in terms of ensuring that they have these financial resources available. Uh, the fact is that there's not a lack of them worldwide, they're just uh, not distributed evenly. Well, yes, indeed, and the investment programs have shown that the money was there. And what we've seen is that it's possible uh, to act. There's a room for maneuver in more developed countries. And likewise, we've seen the suspension of public debt payments. There's a huge level of private debt. And lots of low uh, income countries are paying more in debt to their private investors than uh, what they're investing in their healthcare services. So, what we're seeing is a critical situation. We need to open up the fiscal uh, space for low and middle income countries to be able to act. For example, a country such as Costa Rica was able to invest uh, to ensure universal health care. And this means that this is possible in other countries too. Because what we're seeing is that public goods have been privatized in many cases, uh, health and education alike. So I think we're becoming aware in this extreme situation that a lot of the decisions that were made in the face of this pandemic weren't necessarily able to respond effectively and to maintain levels of investment that were required. Now, you, in your previous role at the OECD, also worked uh, significantly on this issue of tax, a global tax uh, level for companies. We fully support these actions and multinational companies should be taxed wherever they're carrying out their activities to ensure that benefits are reaped by all of the countries where these activities are carried out. But unfortunately, at the moment, a lot of the time, these taxes are only paid where these companies have their headquarters. So this generates a lot more inequality. There should be benefits where the activities are carried out and developed so that the countries can uh, collect tax and invest in education, because otherwise the gap will continue to increase between developed and developing countries. It's important to ensure fair distribution of resources among the different countries. This is a long term solution. Now, there's also the solution of, uh, or rather the example of Argentina, which decided to introduce a solidarity tax on companies in order to respond to those people who were the most affected by the pandemic. So this is one example. Yes, I agree. That is the perspective. And we are... Uh, we share the, this vision that we need to prioritize the mo most vulnerable groups to have their resources in order to provide quality basic uh, services. And you mentioned that actually, the medical uh, health um, care, uh, unemployment uh, services, all those tools that are so important to support, to come and help those that are living very difficult situations that are uh, in a disadvantaged position and that cannot take the 
the shock that uh, this pandemic has brought. And uh, taking into account the fiscal issue, I believe, and I know that Oxfam would have loved to see a higher minimum tax uh, established. But now, yeah, coming back to my ex position at the OECD, I think it's very, very positive to have at least this first step because that means recognizing that some enterprises, some businesses do not pay taxes. So at least to have a minimum step, a minimum level of taxes on this regard, it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, step. But of course, we still need Oxfam to keep on um, lobbying and working for that in order to get the necessary resources. Yes, actually, let me tell you, after the Second World War, we reach 40, 50 percent uh, corporate tax levels because that was the investment need. And uh, this is why we are qu very frustrated about this 15 percent that is really the lowest level. 25 percent, that would be technically the recommended level. Well, we are still hoping that we can reach that because that is really something we can we can reach. We have the capability to, to go to get there. Many, many companies have uh, have registered very positive results, uh, all those tech companies, Amazon and others. So we know that. We, there's a, that's a fact. Uh, the thing is how to make that possible in, in the different countries, how to leverage, how to get that, that taxes. Yes, and that is also a political economy issue inequality that is such a big problem at a human and social uh, from a social and, and human perspective if you take it from an economic and fiscal perspective it's even more more complex but now to conclude on on that topic and, uh, and with that message that you are underscoring on the measures taken by different countries that uh, decided to invest in social um, in the social field with the uh, universal health care coverage uh, schools public health but public services sorry well all those measures and many, many institutions are calling for that, UNESCO included, is to, to develop a new economic development or economic growth uh, model uh, that is not only based on GDP, but based also uh, on, on people. And uh, we are uh, in the same page here. And in this respect, to, well, taking this uh, systemic view into a more specific, concrete um, uh, arena, I'd like to talk about the women issue. Um, this is where you really uh, see things how they are. We're talking about the 50% 50, 50 of the population here. Yes, this is uh, of the essence. And um, I'd like to talk about education of uh, Girls, there have been many, many campaigns on increasing access to education for girls. And after more than a year in some countries of school closure, we are talking about 20 million uh, children, uh, girls that will never come back to the schools. And uh, this happens because we still have the traditional roles that have taken uh, their their uh, toll and well ab abuses and unwanted uh, pregnancies, um, violence, violence in their own homes that has been uh, completely uh, disproportionate during this last year for women and girls. Also, uh, non-paid, unpaid uh, work, and it's not calculated, as you know. We're talking about two, uh, well, millions of hours of unpaid and un uh, unaccounted work that is being made by women and girls, and has been incre has increased obviously due to the the needs, the care needs are linked to the pandemic. Also, because women are more present on the uh, uh, healthcare sector, we have calculated uh, by sectors uh, which were the most affected by the pandemic, and uh, which were uh, which were more uh feminized uh, so to say and uh, we have all that data also situation of uh, uh, indigenous women is is there is uh, 
very it's terrible and we have many examples we have countries that have uh, decided to go a different way. We have New Zealand, for example, that has focused on new on on well well being, well being of uh, those people that were left behind, an indigenous girl, uh, for example, and and those that have been not able to benefit for the for the economic development. Yes. Uh, well, we are here in Paris, and uh, we cannot forget that this is the week of the uh, equ Equity Generation Forum, and UNESCO has a, an important role here, uh, advocating for girls to com go back to school, because there is a big risk here, not only related to poverty, precarity, that has to be resolved at a systemic level. We need a governmental and public decision to help families in order to avoid the, the, the situation where kids cannot go back to schools because they, they, they don't have the resources. But we also need to work on breaking the cultural and social patterns where it's always cheaper to leave girls out of school because in the end, from that perspective, they are not going to be the one leading the economic effort in the family, and that is totally wrong. So I invite you, Oxfam, uh, please be with us. We're going to show some figures uh, indicating the, the gap, uh, the gap between those girls that will never go back to school, and that's dramatic. Um, I also, I'm thinking about Afro African American descendant, Latin American, uh, Latin uh, descent uh, ch children in, in the Americas or in North America, well, the situation is terrible, and we need to, to, to deploy our, all our efforts to make them go back to school. Uh, but in the end, we need a, a bigger agenda, a global agenda on uh, women rights and recognizing the space they, they deserve in the decision making on the social, economic, political uh, scene. And uh, we need to change that rules because otherwise that's impossible. And I am very, very concerned on, on the children's situation, and this is very, very important. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. Dear Gabriela, we, will, we would be really <laughs> delighted to keep talking to you. Um, but to conclude, I would like to, to go back to a more personal level. Uh, you're really an amazing woman. Everything you have done uh, everywhere in Colombia uh, at Oxfam, and I just wanted to 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 put at you a question. And uh, the the thing is, I'd like to know what led you to develop this uh, this engagement uh, to to work on in this field. What what is your motivation that has led your whole career? Well, thank you for that question, Gabriela. Um, I think we share this uh, motivation. I, I was. I, uh, I was born in Cali, I was born and raised there, and uh, my mom used to take me and my brother to mm, these poor uh, neighborhoods uh, because she had uh, a job to do there. And we, while we wait for her, we were war playing with other kids that uh, lived in extreme poverty. They had nothing at all. And they used to play with, with uh, excrements with poop that's uh, what they had and, and uh, that was shocking to me I, I i i have never forgotten that and it's unacceptable to me to realize that i was living just a few kilometers away from some children that had nothing at all and uh, what i just want, wanted to do is to to tell their story to 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 share their reality to to share their vision because we are not so far away we um, we are really close and then there is a gap that is it means a violence a, an extreme violence in the end that uh, many times it's translated into a real physical violence and we have the conflict the armed conflict in colombia for example and um, well, that it's just the, the idea of making aware of this difficult situation many people are living really close to our to, to ourselves. That's that's empathy. That's uh, really 
Really, really nice. Really nice to hear you, to talk to you, to discuss with you. And uh, here at UNESCO, we are dealing with uh, racism, uh, equality as Oxfam, and we will keep on working with you hand in hand. In hand. Thank you very much. All right. So thank you to you all for sharing these dialogues for inclusion. We will see you next uh, time.